I thought I'd do a quick video because uh, we just had a plane crash a few hours ago over in China. Um, it was a Boeing 737-800. It slammed into the mountainside, obviously killing all 130 people on board. Um, it happened in Wazao City, Guangxi region. Um, and it, yeah, there's actually CCTV of this thing coming down and looking at it, I'm looking at the picture now, it's nearly a, a vertical angle. It's it's probably 15 degrees off the vertical. So this is plummeting down. Um, a little confusingly, it says down here, it hit the ground at, uh, what does it say? I can't find it now. It said about three, yeah, 350 miles per hour. Uh, that seems a little slow if it was plummeting vertically. Usually a plummeting plane is going to go near supersonic, if not if not supersonic, you know, when it when it dives like that. Um, it was cruising. It says here 30,000 feet. I don't think that's correct. I think it was a little higher than that, 30,300 or so. Um, but anyway, so it's China Eastern Airlines, um, who have an excellent safety record, a new fleet. I mean, just to say, um, firstly, this is not the Boeing 737 MAX, the one we had the, you know, at least two very famous... Fa um, crashes due to their MCAS system, their MCAS software. But basically with the M, uh, with the Boeing 737 MAX that was grounded for, I think, nearly a couple of years, it's back in the air now, um, they used the same old airframe. They stuck on this massive CS CFM engine, um, which was more economical and so on. You know, it's basically an engine upgrade, a few little tweaks here and there, but it was the same old airframe. And the problem was the engine was so large, they had to sight it a little bit further up the wings, and what uh, and it messed up the plane center of gravity. They needed to redo the whole plane, but they didn't have time to redesign a whole plane because they wanted to compete with um, the Airbus A320 Neo, uh, which was selling very, very well. And so they made this new fuel-efficient Boeing 737 MAX with these wonderful new engines on it, but, as I say, it messed up the centre of gravity, and so the thing would, uh, by itself, pitch into unusual angles that pilots would struggle to control, um, especially when it took them by surprise. Um, and disgracefully, by, by absolutely disgracefully, because one of the big selling points was you don't need simulator training for this. All you have to do is go on your um, iPad or your Android, do a little... Uh, a little quiz, a little learning package you can do in half an hour or less. Answer the questions correctly. And then you were certified for 737 MAX because if they had actually said, hey, it has this new system in it, it's a little different. Because Boeing do things differently to Airbus. Airbus, for years now, have all been about, you know, fly-by-wire, controlling with a joystick, um, just everything being done where possible by computers. I mean, you know, most Airbus crashes... Um, when they have crashed, usually if the pilot had just taken his hands off the stick, the thing would have sorted itself out. You know, that that's you know, certainly the case with the Air France, uh, famous Air France crash back in, what, 2005 when it crashed over the Atlantic. Just, you know, take your hand off the joystick, the plane would have sorted itself out. Um, Boeing has never been like that. They've always had, you know, the real sort of flight yoke there, you know, the big uh, thing you hold with two hands, um, a much more physical... Uh, way of controlling, not a joystick, not not a side stick, um, and but anyway, they didn't. One of the big selling points was simulator training is horrendously expensive, and so if you've got to train hundreds of pilots on a simulator, that might put you off buying your stuff. And so obviously Boeing said, well, we'll um, we'll make this plane just the same as the other one, just a lot more fuel efficient, and didn't bother telling anybody that actually they had to do some serious modifications particularly to this fly-by-wire device, the MCAS system. It stands for um, uh, Maneuverability Control Augment Augmentation System, I think. Maneuver and Control Augment Aug Aug Augmentation System. I think that's right. Certainly, what it, what it does, it just... Um, when it's working properly, it uh, maneuvers the, the, the plane um, to sort out problems that are caused by this displaced centre of gravity. Um, and... The other thing was, again, because they knew they had a very hand-in-glove relationship with uh, the Federal Aviation Authority in the US, and they knew if they um, had to incorporate extra sensors for this system, 
and it all came out, then definitely it would be considered, you know, too much of a difference. Uh, pilots would have to have extra training. They would have lost cells. And so they, um, they crazily, in aviation, you're building redundancy. Yeah. If one system breaks, you've got another system. If that system breaks, you have another system. Yeah. It's like in an Airbus, you have the hydraulics, but even the hydraulics go, you have cables to control all of your flight um, control bits and bobs, you know, your trim and your ailerons and everything else, your flap. You know, you've, you've got redundancy built in. Uh, the Boeing 737 MAX didn't. It had one sensor. Um, and, the mo and, and things go wrong all the time with planes. Um, and this was the problem. They had, you know, the moment that one sensor misbehaved, and the pilots hadn't been told that this is going to go in the computer and it's going to start making your plane nosedive crazily, they didn't know how to switch it off. And the worst thing was with those crashes, I mean, it's a big digression from the China thing, but um, <clears throat> the worst thing of it was it would be on for five seconds and it'd be off for 10 seconds. And so you thought you'd finally got it sorted out. We've leveled it off. And then suddenly MCAS re-engages and nosedives you. And then you're like, flipping egg, no, 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 no. Five seconds later, it turns off and you can level it out. You think, yeah, regain control. Then 10 seconds later, boom, does it again. And this was why with the Silk Air crash and the Ethiopian Airways crash, um, you know, it was, it, was, it was just awful. And it was purely putting money above everybody's safety. It was absolutely disgusting. Um, and so ever since then, I don't like Boeing. Never really have, to be honest. Um, not just because they're American from Seattle. Um, you know... Disgusting, but this is not one of those, is what I'm saying. If it was, wow, you know that they would, the, the aviation world and the whole world, in fact, would just go crazy uh, if there's another Boeing 737 Max crash, um, and I'm sure there will be because, um, you know, I don't think that that, that plane, you know, to me, is not aerodynamically stable. Uh, you know, it, it's just a bad, it's a bad idea to upgrade an ancient airframe with a brand new engine. That doesn't fit uh you know you can compensate with software but software can't can't beat physics um but you know that regardless this is not this is a 737 800 so why did it crash that's the question really so let's just go back to the the, the notes on this um so anyway basically so this jet uh 737 800 with 132 people on board uh all of them dead i mean look if you hit the ground vertically that is not survivable People survive plane crashes, usually. Um, most plane crashes are not fatal, because most plane crashes are not nose down, smashes into the earth. Those you can't survive. Um, <clears throat> the question is, how did this happen? Why did this happen? Um, obviously, I don't know, and one shouldn't speculate. However, I will speculate, because I got insomnia, and I've got nothing else to do. So, um, here's a few suggestions. Uh, a high-altitude stool... Now, the problem with that is, OK, so you understand what a stool is. A stool is not like in your car where uh, your engine suddenly stops. An aerodynamic stool is where your angle of attack is such that you lose the laminar flow over your wing and it's no longer providing lift. And so your wing just makes you fall. So you can stall by being too slow. So there's not enough wind going over your uh, wings. You can stall because... Um, you just angle the thing up too much and the, the wind is buffeting you in the face and it's not flowing laminar in a laminar fashion over the wing. Uh, you can stall because um, uh, you've gone too high, too high in altitude. The air's just too thin. And so you don't have enough density to get that propulsion. Um, you can stall because your engines flame out. There's all sorts of things that can happen. But the thing with this is that's not what's really happened because it was cruising. It was at a cruising altitude. Um, and so the question is, why would it suddenly plummet down in a nose-down attitude? It's, it's very confusing. Um, let's say it did stall. You've got enough time. I mean, how long does it take to fall from 31,000 feet? Um, you can glide for miles and miles. And miles I mean, 3,000 feet per minute, flying at 400 miles an hour. Uh, you know, you can do the math. You can glide for a long, long time. Um, you can exchange all that altitude for time. It didn't do that here. Uh, if you stall, you can point your nose down, get the air flowing again. And then, you know, you can 
get your aircraft under control, you can restart the engines. You can do a windmill start if you're fast enough, or you can use the, what's called the APU, the auxiliary power unit, which is a little jet engine that is designed exactly for this purpose, to give you power if your main engines are flamed out, um, and it can spin them up and get them going again. So that can happen too. It appears not to have happened here. It's just no star dived out the sky, and it seems, for whatever reason, it was unrecoverable. I mean, what other things do we have? Um, we got talk here, maybe sabotage in the, the article I'm reading, which is somewhat um, sensationalised. Um, sabotage, yeah, I don't think that's right. Um, could have got iced up. Yeah, it could have got iced up. If your plane has ice on the wings, even a small amount, again, it disrupts the flow. You lose that beautiful laminar flow over the wing, you lose the lift, and you're full. But then again, these planes have quite elaborate de-icing mechanisms, so that's unlikely. Um, one possibility would be um, that they forgot to turn on their cabin pressure. Now, the checklist that Boeing has, you have at least three checklists you should go through that mention checking your cabin pressure. And cabin pressure is not just um, it's not just one little dial to one side. No, it, you have several different things telling you telling you what's going on. So you have the differential. Uh, we have one big gauge saying the differential is on the right side of the cockpit. Um, I believe certainly a seven four seven. Not sure about seven three seven. Probably the same. Um, it's got one big gauge that has the differential pressure between the inside and the outside of the cockpit. So you can see. You should have a big differential because you're pressurized inside, not outside. Um, you have an altitude pressure um, of the cabin, so it tells you your equivalence. Now, most people can breathe normally at about 10,000 feet. Yeah, once you go above that, uh, you struggle. And I believe when it goes up to about it's either 13 or 14,000 feet, you get an alarm going off, you get a big horn beeping um, if your cabin uh, pressure. It's the equivalent of, you know, 14,000 feet or 30,000 feet, uh, because at that point it becomes a danger to everybody. You know, you will pass out and you need to get your masks on, you need to get your oxygen mask on, you need to take action immediately. Um, masks on, then action. Uh, dive down to 10,000 feet, then sort the problem out. Um, I, could that be the case here? Could it have been that it's at cruising altitude, not got the pressure on, and it just dives? Interesting, in the article I'm reading there, it says that it claims, I have no idea how it knows this, but it claims that the pilot may have regained consciousness and tried to sort it out. Um, but it doesn't say why that is. Um, no. Uh, OK, altitude data appears to show the aircraft re... OK, okay so it does have the evidence. Apologies. Altitude data appears to show the aircraft regain height at around 7,500 feet before beginning the final descent. So that actually is a possibility then. It could be they lost consciousness. You know, you'd have to miss a load of checks to do this. But maybe they got hypoxic because they hadn't turned on their, you know, their automatic pressurization, and they lost consciousness, it falls down, they regained consciousness, or somebody did, at um, you know, 7,500 feet, um, had another go at regaining. But then again, if you regain control at that point, why would you then plunge down? It seems like um, there's a problem with control surfaces here. Uh, I was going to say pilot suicide, because we've seen a lot of pilot murder suicides. Um, there is one out and about uh, which wasn't. It, you know, um, it was an Egypt airplane, and it's always cited as an example of um, pilot suicide. And actually, when you look at it, and the reason why, it's basically just racism and, you know, the typical Islamophobia we have nowadays, um, because the pilot in charge of the plane, the captain, was saying, I trust myself to Allah, in Allah I trust. You know, he was a religious man. He kept saying Allah, basically every sentence it had, a, had you know, God in it. Um, when he's taken off, you know, we have permission to take off. Praise be to Allah. Um, the reason why it wasn't a pilot suicide, even though... Um, the um, the National Air uh, Transportation Safety Board of America said it was, was, first of all, it mistranslated what he said. But the reason why I know that it wasn't is that you hear the co-pilot there helping him. It was a Boeing, had two yokes, 
um, they were both fighting to regain control. Um, and so that's alarming because they didn't do a proper investigation. It's very, very easy when you're hand in glove with a manufacturer to say pilot error and chalk it down to pilot error. Then we don't need to send out any safety bulletins. We don't need to ground any planes. It was just the pilot, suicidal pilot. Um, wasn't the case in that one. I have a little look if you're interested. Um, this one doesn't sound like that. Um, if that's correct, that they regained control, you know, you would think that it was halfway through the flight at cruising altitude. So, yeah, you could wait for maybe a co-pilot to leave or you could incapacitate them, you know, with a weapon if you've been able to smuggle a weapon on, which is not easy, but it's possible. Um, usually you can wait for them to leave the cockpit, maybe, um, and then lock them out and you can't get through one of those doors. But then you put it straight into the ground, wouldn't you? Um, it looks here like more more likely it was control surface problem. The fact that it's dived crazily, it's regained control, and then it's dived. And if you look at that CCTV, it's going almost vertically into the ground. So um, I don't know what's caused this. Um, and, you know, why not have a speculate, you know, there's a channel I like called Mentor Pilot, and he always has a go at everybody who speculates. He's like, why are you speculating? Don't speculate. Wait for the final report. Ah, we can speculate. Everyone has a right to an opinion. Um, and this is interesting because when you're at cruising altitude, you have all that altitude to trade for energy, to trade for speed. Uh, why would you plunge into the ground? Um, whatever the problem is, you have time and you have energy to rectify the problem. Um, if your engines are flamed out for whatever reason, Let's say a panda's gone into them, you know, China Airways. Um, you know, what, maybe the other engine got filled with bamboo. Whatever, um, you have time to sort it. And even if you don't, you can glide, can't you? Um, why is it suddenly nose down? Um, you've got to think it's control surface problem. Another problem that um, Boeing 737s are famous for is the trim settings on the elevator at the back, the um, horizontal stabilizer, isn't it, what they call it? Um, or is it, the, I always get the horizontal and vertical, but it's the one that is horizontal. Is that what you call the horizontal? The, the, yeah, the one that controls the, the nose up, nose down. That's a horizontal stabilizer. Um, the way in which they work is they have a kind of um, drum there that has cabling around it. And then you have a jack screw that can sort of um, turn this thing one way or the other um and it's a very very old design and there have been instances of these things for a variety of reasons locking up jamming up breaking um and so this is the problem again if, if you're flying even a new plane with an old design could it be that the thing just got locked so it's putting the plane into a nose down position and there's nothing the pilots can do. But if that was the case, how do they get out of it at 7,500 feet? Though? How could they regain control, then lose it again? Uh, if that report's correct. Um, I don't know. Uh, but it's really another, another unwelcome bit of news for Boeing. And um, it's a tragedy for those on board. Um, Still the safest form of travel, far safer than your journey in the car to the airport, um, going on a plane, but not a lot of consolation if you're in the plane. Um, so you wait for the, the black boxes have not yet been found. I mean, if you hit the ground that fast, um, we don't particularly know yet um, how reliable, because in the past, your black boxes were hard drives, you know, physical disks with magnetic memory on them. Now, it's all about SD cards and, you know, like, like your flash drive, your pen drive, that kind of thing. Uh, can they survive that kind of impact directly into the ground from a very high altitude? Um, we'll see. I, we, I'm not sure that we, we necessarily know how tough they are. So we wait for the black boxes to be found. It would seem also there's a big fire because it still had a fair way to go on its journey. Um, and so when it crashed, obviously it burst into flames um, and it started a forest fire as well. So it'll be interesting to see whether those, um, you know, cockpit voice recorder and um, flight data recorder, uh, if those are still patent and usable and so on. 
Um, but yeah, just a bit of, of speculation and another, yeah, another worrying story for Boeing.